Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's ARC Talks webinar on clinical trials and amyloidosis. My name is Lori Volpet, and I'm the manager of healthcare and education at the Amyloidosis Research Consortium, or ARC. Um, before we get started, I would like, just like to point out some features of this platform. I think it's new to some of you. Um, we have set aside questions or time for questions at the end of this presentation. So please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box as you think of them. And my, um, myself, my colleague, Kristen Sue, and our guest speaker, Lauren Ives, um, will take the time to answer those at the end of the presentation today. Um, you can also resize or minimize any boxes. So if you wanted to make the slides full screen, um, you can just use the buttons in that uh, box's header. Now, I would just like to provide a little bit of background about the Amyloidosis Research Consortium, if you're not familiar with us. We were founded in 2015 with the mission to accelerate the development of and access to new and innovative treatments for systemic amyloidosis and improve quality of life for patients. We work closely with patients, patient organizations, physicians, pharmaceutical companies, regulatory agencies, and researchers to drive our mission forward. Our four main areas of focus are improving the speed and accuracy of diagnosis, increasing the um, understanding of the science of the diseases, accelerating approval for effective treatments, and enhancing quality of life for patients. Um, we have put in a couple of polls just so we could get to know who's here with us today. Um, so if you wouldn't mind taking the time to answer um, what type of amyloidosis are you or your loved one affected with? And we'll give about 20 or 30 seconds to answer that. Okay, so let's see. We have largely an AL audience today. Very interesting. Okay, thank you. And then another question we have is. Um, have you, um, or you know, if you're here as a caregiver, if your loved one has ever, or are you currently participating in a clinical trial? Okay, and pretty even spread. <laughs> All right. And like I said, today we'll be talking about clinical trials in amyloidosis, and we are very fortunate to have Lauren Ives here with us today. Lauren is the Amyloid Heart Disease Research Coordinator at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, and will take us through the basics of clinical trials, some common terminology you might encounter, um, what you could expect if you were to participate, and more. And I will be back on after Lauren's presentation to go over the clinical trials in amyloidosis that are currently enrolling, as well as how to use our My Amyloidosis Pathfinder tool to find more information on clinical trials. Lauren, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead. Hi, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. And thank you to the Amyloidosis Research Consortium for inviting me to give this talk. Um, as Lori said, my name is Lauren Ives, and I am a registered nurse at the Cleveland Clinic. I have worked with our research department for about the past six years, and I'm currently the amyloid heart disease research coordinator there. And today we're going to talk about clinical trials, uh, kind of what they are, um, how to find one, and what to expect if you decide to take part. So clinical trials are research studies that are conducted in people in order to study and test new medical treatments. These people can be healthy participants or they can be patients with a specific health issue, for example, amyloidosis. And these medical treatments can be anything from drugs to vaccines to blood products, medical devices, medical procedures, diagnostic tests, or even behavioral interventions. Clinical trials may also be conducted to study new combinations of treatments, to compare two or more treatments, or to study an already available treatment for a new use. For example, we may study a drug that's currently used to treat depression in patients that have chronic pain. And clinical trials can sometimes also study the role of caregivers or support groups. Clinical trials typically follow a series of events, uh, going from laboratory studies to large-scale studies in humans, moving from right or from left to right across this slide. 
The idea for a clinical trial often starts in the lab. After researchers test new treatments or procedures in the lab and in animals, the most promising treatments are moved into clinical trials. As new treatments move through a series of steps called phases, more information is gained about the treatments, its risks, and its effectiveness. This is generally a very long process. Um, sometimes because of uh, special or extenuating circumstances, this can be sped up, uh, which is what we've all seen happen with the COVID-19 vaccines. But typically it can take anywhere from 10 to 15 years on average for a drug to go from development to FDA approval. So why may you wanna participate in a clinical trial? It's important to remember that before any drug can be approved, it must be rigorously tested in clinical trials. And without the participation of patients, new treatments and cures will never happen. Everyone participates in a clinical trial for a different reason. So yours may be one or more of the ones that I've listed below, or it may be um, something else entirely. So a lot of patients participate because they want to have the opportunity to access new treatments before they become available. As we'll discuss a little later, oftentimes research studies require um, some extra visits and testing at the clinical trial site. So some patients really appreciate that they can have that additional care and time and attention with clinical trial staff and their physicians. Uh, you could help future patients with your same condition. Um, even if the, um, or I'm sorry, while uh, clinical trials don't necessarily guarantee um, that you'll benefit from them, um, you know, you could help, again, someone in the future. Clinical trials offer hope. They can be a cost-effective way to receive treatment. Um, so as you may be aware, some of the new drugs for amyloidosis can be um, extremely costly and may unfortunately be unaffordable to you. So that may be a reason to consider a clinical trial. And clinical trials also help to move science forward. So even if the treatment uh, doesn't prove to be effective, there's still a lot of information that can be gained from that. And you could help researchers um, get one step closer to making that big breakthrough. How may you find a clinical trial? So my first recommendation here is to ask your physician or your amyloidosis healthcare provider. If you're seeking care um, at a large hospital, I guarantee you they have research going on. And I think some patients um, might assume that if there's a clinical trial that they qualify for, that their physician will um, tell them about it. But I think it's important to remember that they're humans too, and sometimes days they may be very busy or kind of pulled in a lot of directions. They may forget to mention research to you during your visit. So I encourage you to go ahead and bring, be the one to bring that up and not necessarily wait for them. And if there's not a clinical trial right now that you qualify for, you can always ask them to keep you in mind for future research or to pass your name along to research staff. The Amyloidosis Research Consortium has the My Amyloidosis Pathfinder tool, or MAP for short. And one of its goals is to connect patients with amyloidosis with clinical trials. And Lori's gonna talk about that tool later. Um, it's really excellent, so stay tuned to hear more about that. And then my third recommendation would be to check out clinicaltrials.gov. So as you can see, clinicaltrials.gov is a website that contains literally hundreds of thousands of research studies on it. And this includes both the United States and around the world. So you can search in that condition or disease field for the specific kind of amyloidosis that you have. And then you can narrow it down to studies that are currently open and enrolling and looking for patients. And you can narrow that down to um, the location of the country that you're in and, and where you might wanna participate. And this isn't, the website isn't limited um, to just, you know, drug studies or things like that. There are all kinds of um, studies for patients with amyloidosis. Um, so even if you, you know, aren't interested in taking a new medication, you already take too many, uh, whatever the case may be, um, you may be able to find something um, that more suits your schedule. And uh, this website is also not simply limited to amyloidosis studies, obviously. So if you have a family or a friend um, that has another health condition that they may be interested in participating in research with, um, they can check out this website as well. When you are searching around on the internet for clinical trials, 
you may notice that some of them have some pretty long and potentially confusing names but uh, they can really kind of tell you a lot about what the study is involved if you know some key terminology. So this example here is just um, kind of an example of what the title of a drug study might start off looking like. And if we go ahead and break this down, we can, um, starting with, we can see it's a phase three study. So if you remember from that previous slide uh, with that graphic, um, we can determine from this that this is a drug that's made it through laboratory testing it's made it through phase one testing in humans. It's made it through phase two testing in humans. So now we're on to phase three, which means that it's going to be a larger scale study. Uh, so in other words, enrolling a lot of patients. And it's going to be looking at, as you can see from the title, uh, really the safety and efficacy of this new drug treatment. And then working backwards a little bit, this is a controlled study. And a controlled study is one in which there are at least two groups of participants. So one group will receive a new treatment and then a second group will receive a comparison treatment or sometimes no treatment. And this second group it's was, is what is known as the control group. This is specifically a placebo controlled trial. And this is the most common type of control that you'll see used in a drug study. Um, and I think everyone uh, kind of refers to it as a sugar pill a lot. But basically, uh, placebo is just an inactive control that looks identical to the study treatment. So for example, if the new study treatment is a small white round pill, the placebo is going to be a small white round pill. And the point of this placebo is to determine if the effects of the study treatment are related to the actual biological or chemical properties of that treatment versus any sort of psychological effects that someone might have from taking a new treatment, um, which is referred to as the placebo effect. This is a randomized study, which means that participants are randomly allocated to the treatment group or the control group. And this typically occurs through computer programming, and it just really helps ensure that the groups are evenly distributed uh, without any sort of bias. And we can see from the title that this is a double-blinded study. So a blinded study is one in which participants are unaware of what treatment they're receiving. And a double-blinded study is one in which both the clinical trial staff and the participants are unaware of what treatment they're receiving. And this just helps really cut down on any sort of um, preconceptions or, again, any sort of bias with the study. So now that we've talked about what clinical trials are, um, how to find one, why you might want to participate, um, we're going to talk about what to expect if you decide to take part. Uh, this may vary a bit depending on what type of study that you sign up for, um, but generally there are kind of four main categories of participation, and that's the informed consent, the screening visit, the baseline visit, and then the follow-up visits. So the informed consent is the first step of the clinical trial process, and I think sometimes um, people can kind of just assume or it's just getting that signature on the consent form. Um, but really, it's a process, and one could argue it's the most important part of the process that involves um, providing the potential participant um, you know, with adequate information to allow for an informed decision about whether they want to participate or not, helping to facilitate um, their understanding of that information, allowing a, um, an appropriate amount of time to ask questions, discuss with family and friends the details of the clinical trial. So this means that you should always be allowed to take that information home, sleep on it for a day, a week, whatever you need before you make a decision. Again, it does involve obtaining that voluntary agreement to participate. And it also involves continuing to provide information um, about the trial as it progresses. So this means that if you sign up for a study today and a year from now, there's some new information about the treatment that you're receiving, that you'll be given that um, information. It's not um, kept hidden. Everything's, you know, try to be as transparent as possible. And the informed consent process really revolves around this informed consent document. And it's a document that you should always be provided a physical copy of to review. And I would say on average, it can range anywhere from about five to 25 pages in length. On the shorter end of that spectrum might be a study that just involves, um, you know, an extra blood draw or a one-time um, extra MRI image, something of that nature. And on the longer end, it might be a study that, a uh, drug study that lasts for several years. 
This should always be written in a language that's understandable to you. So this means um, not only the literal langu language, if English is not your preferred uh, language for reading in, but also that it's not gonna be filled with a bunch of crazy medical jargon um, that makes it hard for, for the average person to understand. Accommodations should be made for special circumstances if they apply to you or your loved one. So this means if you have any sort of um, limited literacy or um, cognitive disabilities, things of that nature, that um, accommodations should be made so that you could still participate in that trial. And I don't see this super commonly in amyloid studies, but it does happen that if for some reason, um, you know, the person couldn't consent for themselves, that there are accommodations with a, having a legally authorized representative consent on their part. So most importantly, it's important that you read thoroughly, take ample time to consider, and ask lots of questions when you're reviewing that document. And this document is not a contract. It simply represents an agreement to participate in the trial and an understanding of what it will involve. So as a participant, you may always withdraw your consent and leave the trial at any time if you choose to do so. So the informed consent document will vary um, from site to site, from hospital to hospital, but at minimum, it should kind of contain these nine key sections. So we already talked about the title and how to understand that. You should be able to know who the study sponsor is. Um, so that can be anything from a pharmaceutical company to a medical device study. It could be the government, um, such as the National Institute of Health, they sponsor research, or it could be um, your local hospital or physician sponsoring the research. And then obviously contact information is pretty straightforward. So the next sections, I was really trying to kind of highlight the importance of really, um, really reviewing the consent thoroughly and understanding kind of what you're getting yourself into, if you will, when you sign up for um, a research study. Like I mentioned, you're free to withdraw and leave the study at any time, but we really like to avoid that uh, for two main reasons. Number one, if a large number of patients withdraw from the study, then um, there's a large amount of data that could be missing from those patients, which could um, affect the ability of that treatment to, to be um, approved. And number two is oftentimes there are a limited number of enrollment slots for patients. So that means that if you sign up for a research study today, and then a week from now you decide, oh, you know, I um, didn't really you don't understand how often I had to come to the study site or whatever the reason may be, that that slot is probably taken by you and can't be replaced um, with another patient who could have potentially benefited from that treatment. So I think one of the ways that we can avoid that again is to really, um, really review that document thoroughly. So for the information on the research, this is really the um, kind of meat and potatoes, if you will, of the study. So questions to ask or things to consider when you are reviewing that is what is the purpose of the study? What does the study treatment do? Has the treatment been used before? Will I know which treatment I receive? Is there a chance I may get a placebo? And if so, what is the chance of that happening? Will the study treatment be in addition to or in place of my current treatment? What testing is involved? Will I receive the results of that testing? How many people will be participating? How often do I have to come to the study site? Will I have to stay in the hospital at all? And how long will the study last? For alternatives to participation, things to consider are what are my other choices? What are their benefits and risks? And what is likely to happen to me without this treatment? I'm gonna come back to risks of participation on the next slide because um, that's kind of a big one. So for benefits, will participating provide any direct benefit to me? Can I expect any improvement in my symptoms? If I benefit from the treatment, will I be allowed to continue receiving it after the trial ends? Cost information, will the treatment be free? What tests are paid for by the research study versus what tests are billed to my insurance? If I don't have insurance, am I still eligible to participate? Payment or compensation, will I receive any sort of payment for participating? Will I re be reimbursed for expenses such as travel, parking, or lodging? And will the cost of my caregiver be covered if I need to have someone come to me, come with me for those study visits? Research-related injury, if I'm harmed as a result of the research, what treatment may, might I get? Will I have to pay for that treatment or will my insurance company be billed for that treatment? Privacy and confidentiality, 
Uh, so what steps are in place to ensure my privacy? Will my name or other identifying information be shared with anyone? And who will have access to my healthcare records? Again, so circling back to risk of participation, um, it's important to remember that protecting patient safety is a top priority in any clinical trial, but there are always potential risks, and these can include both known and potentially unknown risks. Obviously, there are the risks of the study treatment, and it's important to compare these to the risks of the treatment that you're currently receiving, as well as the risks um, if you were to not receive any treatment or not treat your condition. Uh, you should be aware of the risks of study testing, so for example, if uh, the study testing requires imaging, such as an MRI or a nuclear scan, that there are radiation risks with that. And these consent forms even will include in very detail um, the risks of even like a blood draw as such as bruising or bleeding. So they really get into depth here. There may be reproductive risks that are important to consider if that's applicable to you. And then any study involves the risk of loss of confidentiality. So you'll see that in the consent form noted. Um, generally, all of the data for the study is de-identified and stored in, you know, secure password protected areas. Um, but obviously, you know, we watch the news, there's hackers and crazy things like that out there. Um, so that's important to consider. And then kind of piggybacking on the last slide, questions to ask or to understand while you're reading that section are what side effects can I expect from the study treatment? What is the chance I will experience those side effects? Can the side effects be controlled? What are the risks of the study-related testing? And I wanted to point out that there are um, specific additional risks if it involves any sort of genetic testing or HIV or infectious disease testing. What happens if my health problems get worse during the study? And what are the risks if I were to become pregnant or breastfeed during the study? So we compiled all these questions and a few others um, onto a handout, and I think that's in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. So if that's helpful, helpful to you, please feel free to check that out. After you have reviewed the informed consent, and if you've decided you would like to go ahead and participate in that study, the next step would be to schedule a screening visit. And a screening visit is used to determine eligibility for a clinical trial. And it's here that participants must meet of what we, a set of what we call inclusion criteria and not meet any exclusion criteria. And these are often strict criteria put in place for both safety purposes and to minimize any variation in the study groups that might influence the results of the study. So I kind of joke that this is, um, to put it simply, you have to have something wrong with you, but not too much wrong with you. Um, some of the criteria may be met through historical testing. So we could review your medical history, if you've had genetic testing done, if you've had a tissue biopsy to confirm the presence of amyloid deposits. Those types of things don't need to be repeated, but other criteria may require more current updated testing. So this means that even if you had lab work done last week, you may have to have additional lab work done this week. There are a slew of different tests that can be performed at the screening visit. And these are generally all performed at the study site, but I will say I have seen an uptick in the use of home healthcare services within the past year. Uh, so there are a chance that some of these services may be able, or some of this testing may be able to be performed you know, in your home or closer to your home. So commonly you'll have a physical exam completed and sometimes you'll require a physical exam with more than one specialist. So you may see someone in cardiology or hematology and then maybe neurology or any of the other ologies you wanna see. Um, it's common to have your medical history and uh, review your current medications with the study staff. Questionnaires are commonly utilized and there are quite a slew of different questionnaires you may see. And these just really involve um, trying to assess how you feel your health status is. Imaging is common. So for example, x-rays, MRIs, echocardiograms will be utilized, laboratory testing, and then functional testing is sometimes also um, used at the screening visit. And the most common version of this that I see is a six minute walk test. If you're not familiar with it, it's kind of exactly like it sounds. You walk for six minutes and the, the study or trial staff records the distance that you cover during that time. These tests are often repeated at various intervals throughout the course of the study. So if you're in a multi-year study, those questionnaires might start to look really familiar to you and you may kind of become a pro at that walk test. If all the testing completed at the screening visit show that you qualify for the trial, a baseline visit will be scheduled. 
Here, um, if applicable, you will be randomly assigned to either that treatment group or the control group that we talked about. And this is really kind of the treatment start date. So you'll receive that first dose of the study medication, the medical device would be implanted, or that medical procedure will take place. At this visit, you'll receive education about how to take, use, and store the study treatment. Repeat testing um, that was conducted at the screening visit is very common. Participants may receive a diary to take home in which they will record information such as any side effects, medication changes, and health condition changes should they occur. And then you'll be informed about when your next study follow-up visit will be. These study follow-up visits usually make up the majority of the study. Again, depending on the type of study that you've signed up for, um, they could go on for several years. Here, you'll return to the clinical trial site or the hospital at regularly scheduled intervals and have a lot of that same testing repeated. You'll be asked to report any changes in your health, even if they are unrelated to the study treatment. Compliance to the study treatment will be reviewed. In between clinic visits, you may have home health care visits, telephone or virtual visits with the clinical trial staff, or you may be required to go to the laboratory and have um, testing done there. These visits continue on until the conclusion of the study. And then I just wanted to point out that you should continue to see a regular physician and continue all your usual health care needs throughout the course of the study. Once all participant visits have been completed and the trial has been closed, all study information and data are collected, compiled, analyzed, and interpreted. This can take quite some time depending on the size and complexity of the study but eventually a final report will be produced and it potentially will be published. And it's at this time that you will get the results of the study that you participated in. Further trials may be conducted um, or if the treatment has successfully passed all testing, it may be approved um, for release to the market. Um, another option is that treatments can go undergo um, some post-market -mo monitoring or surveillance, which are those phase four studies. And it's at this time that you may find out whether you are receiving the study treatment or the control. And then I just wanted to highlight some responsibilities that you have as a participant in a clinical trial. Number one is always to be completely honest when applying to a research study. So this means being forthcoming with your medical history and um, being upfront with all the medications you're taking at that time. The next one is to always follow the study protocol. So study protocols are very carefully designed. Um, they're very carefully reviewed over long periods of time and a lot of thought is really put into them. And so it's important to follow them, not only for your safety, but um, if the protocol is not followed, it could potentially compromise um, the integrity of the study and again, potentially compromise the ability of that treatment to get approved for, for everyone. You should maintain the study diary if required, obviously take the study medication as prescribed, it's important to remember to notify clinical trial staff of any changes in your health as soon as possible, even if you've sought medical help elsewhere or feel it's unrelated to the study treatment. And this can be even minor things that you normally wouldn't even mention, we wanna hear about it. You should notify clinical trial staff of any changes in your medication, and that includes both prescription and over-the-counter. And it's important to notify your other healthcare providers that you are participating in a clinical trial um, obviously, this is especially true if you're taking a new drug or had some sort of medical device, uh, please tell other people about it. There are certainly some black marks, if you will, on human research in this country. And um, that history may influence a uh, participant's willingness to participate. But it's important to remember that protecting patient safety is a top priority on any trial. And every trial is very carefully regulated. So researchers, researchers are required to follow strict rules to make sure that participants are safe. These rules are enforced by the federal government. Your two uh, big ones there are gonna be the Food and Drug Administration and the Office of Human Research Protection. Um, but on a local level, you have your um, clinical, investiga clinical investigator or principal investigator who is most likely gonna be your local physician. And they're in charge of all aspects of the clinical trial including letting the study sponsor know right away um, if there are any severe side effects with the treatment. Also locally, you have the institutional review board who are made up of doctors, scientists, advocates, and community members. Um, they make sure that you as a participant are not exposed to any unnecessary risks 
and they regularly review the study to um, see how those risks are related uh, to expected benefits for the study. If you're participating in a large study, especially a phase three study, there's gonna be a data and safety monitoring committee. And these are an independent committee of medical experts who periodically look at the um, results of the study as it progresses. And I can assure you if they find any way that the study treatment is not working or is harming participants, they stop the trial. So again, above all these groups is the federal government, including the FDA, who routinely and regularly audit clinical trial sites and clinical trial sponsors. So while it's important to remember that there's always some level of risk with clinical trials, there are many layers of protection in place in order to reduce those risks. And I feel like this was kind of a very long way of saying, and I, I hear this term a lot, and I think some patients say it in jest, but that you are not, and we would never want you to feel like that you're the, the guinea pig by participating in a clinical trial. So key takeaways from, for today are that clinical trials are research studies that are designed to explore whether a medical strategy, drug treatment, or device is safe and effective for patients. Without the participation of patients, new treatments and cures will never happen. As a clinical trial participant, it is your responsibility to thoroughly read and understand the informed consent document, follow all study protocols, and stay in close communication with clinical trial staff. Protecting patient safety is a top priority on any trial, and every trial is carefully regulated. Clinical trial participation is always optional, so you should never feel pressure to participate. And I just want to say thank you, uh, not to be too cheesy, but it has been my um, extreme honor and privilege to work with so many wonderful patients, family members, friends, caregivers. Um, it truly is a team effort, and without you, none of this would be possible. So thank you. Lauren, thank you so much. That was a lot of great information. And I'm already seeing some great questions coming in for you. Um, just a reminder, we will take some time to address all your questions at the end of this. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be covering the current clinical trials in amyloidosis. And just a reminder, um, if you are interested in any of the trials you see here today, please be sure to discuss with your physician and they can help you decide if that trial would be a good option for you. Um, just to kind of piggyback on what Lauren mentioned, um, the participation of patients is so, so important to um, the development of new treatments. And we just kind of wanted to review what has been accomplished in the past few years because of participation um, from patients like you. Um, so we've had three, um, I'm sorry, four drugs approved just in the past few years. And of course, most recently is the daratumumab for AL, which was approved just two weeks ago. So very exciting times. And um, thank you everyone to Thank you to everyone who has participated um, in clinical trials thus far. Um, let's see, okay, so we have divided up the current clinical trials into um, type and symptomology. So first here we'll cover hereditary TTR with um, polyneuropathy or nerve involvement. Um, and we'll focus on the recruiting trial, um, which is um, the Axia TTR LRX trial. Um, and just a reminder, we have all the companies that we've worked with to put this presentation together are committed to making sure um, part uh, participation in the trials are as easy and stress-free as possible. So if there's various assistance set up, um, so travel assistance, hotel stays, um, different things like that, they really wanna make it comfortable and easy for the patients to be able to participate. So um, all of the companies have passed along that, that um, those options are in place for those that need it. Um, so this trial from Axia um, is called the Neurotransform Study. Um, and this is um, investigating the efficacy and safety of the Axia TTR LRX, which is given via a subcutaneous injection every four weeks. Um, this is considered a gene silencer treatment. So um, it aims to lower the amount of um, circulating TTR in the, in the, in the body. Um, this is controlled, um, the control arm, which you would have a 15% chance of being in that arm, um, is given 
um, in a tercin, which is already approved for um, hereditary TTR with polyneuropathy. Um, and then after you would receive that in a tercin for 34 weeks, and then you would receive the new um, TTR LRX drug from 37 weeks onward. Um, some main eligibility criteria here um, is that you have had no liver transplant or planned liver transplant within the next year and no prior treatment with Tegsteti or on Patro. Um, some tests you might experience if you were to participate in this trial are blood and urine tests, um, which can be done via home health care. So they try to make that as you know, easy as possible so you don't have to go into the clinic so frequently. Um, some neuropathy assessments and various surveys and questionnaires about how you're feeling and quality of life. And there are currently 10 sites in the U.S. with more planned um, and... Um, more sites globally as well outside the U.S. Okay, and then we have um, treatments in clinical trials for TTR with cardiomyopathy or heart involvement, of which there are three currently recruiting, which is very exciting. Um, the first one we will talk about is the CardioTransform study from Axia and Ionis. Uh, this study is a bit larger with 750 estimated um, patients to be enrolled. Um, again, this uses the Axia TTR LRX product, which is the gene silencer. Um, and this is uh, controlled via placebo. However, um, they do not prohibit the use of tofamidus. So participants may take tofamidus while they are participating in this trial. Um, some main eligibility criteria here is no prior heart or liver transplant, and again, no prior treatment with Tegsteti or on Patro. Um, blood and urine tests will be um, frequently checked, and again, home health care is set up to make that as easy as possible. Um, participants will receive an echo or will have an echocardiogram yearly and um, participate in a six minute walk test to evaluate um, any changes in that. Um, and that will be about every six months. And for this one, there are currently 31 US sites and more globally. So now we have two trials from Al Nylum. Um, the first one here is the Apollo B study, which is investigating the use of patisserin, which has already been approved um, for hereditary TTR patients with polyneuropathy. Um, this study is evaluating its use in cardiomyopathy. Um, Patisserin is an intravenous infusion given um, every three weeks. And some main eligibility criteria here is that participants should not have um, prior TTR lowering treatment, no prior or planned heart, liver, or other organ transplant and um, have either never taken to famdis or have taken to famdis for at least six months and are still showing signs of disease progression. Uh, some common tests you may have if you were to participate in this trial are um, blood tests, various cardiac testing, six minute walk tests, and again, surveys and questionnaires for um, quality of life and um, different assessments there. The next study with um, Al Nylum is called the Helios B study. And um, this is for either hereditary or wild type TTR patients with cardiomyopathy. And this is studying the effectiveness and safety of vagisarin, um, which is another type of gene silencer. And they are looking to enroll about 600 patients. Um, there are currently 11 sites in the US with more sites globally. Um, this trial does use um, a control arm, so 50% chance that you would receive a placebo here. Um, and some basic testing that might be done are blood tests, cardiac tests, six minute walk tests, and questionnaires for this one as well. Um, and it is important to note here for all these trials, these there are more um, testing and assessments to be done to ensure that you are eligible. Um, I've just kind of included the main eligibility criteria here um, so that you could see if this is maybe something you would want to look into more. Okay, and then we have um, AL amyloidosis clinical trials. Um, there are currently two recruiting. Um, 
So Kalen has a phase two trial and two phase three trials um, that are currently recruiting. And Sorrento has a phase one trial in patients with relapsed refractory disease. Um, for the CALM trials, we are going to focus on the phase three trials today. And this first one here is evaluating the efficacy and safety of their anti-amyloid monoclonal antibody, Gallum 101. And it is important to give that distinction of the anti-amyloid property because the treatment actually aims to reduce or eliminate amyloid deposits. Um, the two trials are for newly diagnosed patients with no prior treatment and have um, one for Mayo stage 3A patients and one for stage 3B patients. Um, and the essential difference there is just a more progressed cardiac involvement. And this... And sorry, back on the Keelum trials, there are um, 14 sites in the U.S. with more planned and ex-U.S. sites as well. And the final trial we'd like to cover today is the Sorrento Phase One trial to evaluate the efficacy and safety of their treatment STI-6129, which is a CD38 antibody. Um, kind of on the smaller side for this um, trial at 60 patients, and it is not placebo controlled, so all patients would receive that active treatment. Um, this is, again, for relapsed refractory patients, so patients that have received at least two prior lines of treatment. And um, the visit schedule are, is three weeks cycles of treatment, depending on the response and the follow up for 12 months. Um, some testing that you might um, have for this trial include eye exams, echocardiograms, um, CT scans, nerve conduction studies, and blood and urine tests as well. And although the focus today was on treatment trials, we do feel it's very important to touch on imaging and monitoring trials and registries. Um, there are quite a bit available to patients um, right now, and so we've outlined many of these on a handout, which you should be able to see in your resources section. Um, these are you know, very important as well to help us learn more about amyloidosis and its progression and help advance um, science and treatments and um, help us learn more. So if you're interested in that, we have a handout for you there. And Lauren mentioned earlier about our My Amyloidosis Pathfinder tool, or MAP for short. So I wanted to take a moment to show you what this looks like and what you might find um, on this site. So we currently have over 2,300 members who are using MAP to find treatment centers, clinical trials, and to create an appointment companion, which we just added this past year. Um, and that helps to aid communication and your priorities with your treatment um, and help you, you know, make sure you get all your questions answered by your provider. So MAP will start by asking you some basic questions about your age, diagnosis, organ involvement, and current treatment. And it will show you clinical trials that you may match with and also alert you as new trials are added. This is a free, easy to use tool, and it breaks down the information that is posted on clinicaltrials.gov in a more um, easy to read overview. And this is an example of what you might see. Um, so on the left side of the screen there, there's a list of trials that this patient um, potentially matches with. And then if you were to click in one um, on the right, there is what you would see with all the information laid out um, and it, we add the, the sites as they're added to clinicaltrials.gov. So if one comes up near you, we'll add that. Um, and so it's a pretty nice tool. And um, we've also included a link to that in the bottom left hand of your screen. And it's a um, direct link to the My Amyloidosis Pathfinder site if you wanted to check it out. So we do have two more questions for you. Um, so how likely is it that you would participate in a clinical trial during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, ARC is interested in 
um, kind of addressing the potential barriers that this pandemic may be um, posing to, to accessing clinical trials. So if you would just take a moment to answer that. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then last question here, um, ARC is interested in learning more about your perspective perspectives on participating in clinical trials during the pandemic. And so we um, would like to know if anyone is interested in participating in a panel or focus group to provide your perspectives to us. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I'd now like to open it up to questions. Um, and I'd like to welcome back our guest speaker, Lauren from the Cleveland Clinic. And also joining us for questions is ARC's Executive Director of Clinical Research, Kristen Sue. Um, Lauren can answer you know, anything that she covered. And then if you have questions about more specific trials, um, I think we'll direct those to Kristen. And we see a lot coming in, so that's great. Um, and I think the best way to do this, I will push the question to the slide area so that our audience can see um, which question we're discussing. All right, this question is for Lauren. Um, it says you shared that clinical trials covers trials in all 50 states and 219 countries. Are residents in US territories um, like Puerto Rico and Guam also included? Yeah, I believe so. Um, I think clinicaltrials.gov really kind of covers the world, if you will. So I think if you're looking for a study in Puerto Rico, I'm not sure what's going on in Guam these days, but you should be able to, to search there and find one. Great, thank you. Okay, Kristen, um, I'm not sure if you could speak to this, um, but we have a patient asking what is the status of the IDOS AG10 treatment. I'm not sure yeah. if this person is referring to um, the upcoming study or the ongoing um, cardiomyopathy study, but if you could just speak to it in general. Yeah, so AG10 is currently in a phase three study for ATTGR cardiomyopathy, both hereditary and wild type patients. Um, that study has fully enrolled and it is ongoing. Um, IDOS announced late in 2020 that they are planning, they expect to have data um, for the first 12 months of the study available at the end of 2021, early 2022. Um, and so that study is ongoing, it's no longer enrolling, um, but it is active. So, um, And then there is a study in polyneuropathy that is recruiting outside of the U.S., um, and that study remains in calling. Great, thank you. Um, this question is about the CAL-101. Um, are you able to share what has been discovered in um, phase one and two? Yeah, so the phase one study looked at um, uh, cardiac function for patients um, through echocardiograms. I think we can, it's probably better to provide specific data offline um, and we can share that with the group more broadly. Um, so um, yeah, but the, the phase one study looked at cardiac function through echocardiogram and the phase two study was a dose study to help determine phase three selection. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question about would my current doctor get involved in clinical trials? I think um, maybe if you could just speak to that process and maybe generally speaking, how many um, physicians participate in clinical trials or how many are just, um, or how many you know are interested in academic and research trials and, and how that process works. Me? Um, I was, you made it to Kristen, but if, if <laughs> you wanted to speak to it too, I, didn't know. I know at the clinic there is a lot of involvement there. So Lauren, if you would want to take it, sure. Oh, um, 
Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, it probably depends on obviously on where your physician is located um, and the size and resources of the hospital or medical facility that you're seeking care at. Um, you know, we talked about a lot of the testing and imaging and things like that. So uh, to be able to participate in trials, your doctor would have to have access to those, um, you know, th that equipment. Um, so that's certainly, um, you know, there are a lot of sites that participate and that's certainly something that they may be able to be involved with, with if they're interested. Great, thank you. Um, Kristen, um, are you able to share anything about the CRISPR clinical trials? So the CRISPR clinical trials um, are, so CRISPR-Cas9 is a technology that's being used in TTR amyloidosis. Um, it's a product developed by Intellia. They have initiated a phase one study, um, and so they've dosed their first patient. Um, it is a study that is being conducted outside of the U.S., so it will be some time um, before that drug trial um, or future drug trials in CRISPR-Cas9 come to the U.S. Okay, thank you. Um, could you share a little bit about the CRISPR um, drug delivery or anything like that? I think there's probably some materials that we can provide to patients um, outside of this call. But okay, that's something great. that we can definitely provide. Mm -hmm. And just so our audience knows, um, we are able to see which, you know, who asks which questions. Um, so we do, if there's anything that we can't answer, um, the companies we work with to put together this webinar um, have agreed to, to take questions and get back to you. And we'll send the question through anonymously. Um, so feel free to ask anything about a specific trial and we'll make sure that your questions are answered. Okay, I will take this question, which is about the Sorrento trial, um, because there was only one site listed, um, and this person wanted to know which site, and, and that is at, um, it's associated with Columbia University. It's at the Herbert Irving um, Comprehensive Cancer Center. Okay, um, Kristen, I'm not sure if you are able to answer this, um, but is there a study plan to test daratumumab on relapsed patients? So there hasn't been one announced that I'm aware of. Um, and so as far as I know, there's not one that's been put out in the public domain. Um, and so that is something that could, could happen. Um, but right now, Janssen has not, to my knowledge, announced that they will be um, conducting one. Okay, thank you. Um, Lauren, um, this patient is asking, um, I've been reluctant to join clinical trials because I always seem to be sensitive to any drugs that I have not, that I have been prescribed. Therefore, I feel like I would be a bad candidate. Do you think that a trial would not want me as a candidate? Uh, so I would say that we've never excluded patients uh, just because they, um, you know, have had reactions to drugs in the past. If there's any sort of contraindication uh, to taking a drug that's in a trial, um, that's one of those what we call exclusion criteria. Um, so you would be excluded if, for example, uh, there's sulfa in the drug and you have a sulfa allergy. Um, obviously, we would exclude you from that trial. Um, so I think it's really up to your comfort level and whether you feel comfortable trying a new drug or if it would you know, maybe make you too nervous or you'd be too worried about the side effects. Um, I do wanna point out that you know, there are plenty of other trials that don't involve taking drugs um, that are equally as important to participate in and we need patients for just as much. So if, um, again, you're not comfortable with a drug study, there are studies you know, that are looking at new imaging techniques and you know, studies that uh, just involve answering questionnaires or blood draws things like that, that um, may interest you. Perfect, thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Um, and also, oh, for, 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 um, can a Canadian participa um, participate in a U.S. study? 
Yes, you can. We have had uh, patients from, I have had patients from Canada in studies here in Ohio before. There's sometimes a little, um, a little more complexity to it, but um, it's definitely a possibility. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this is an interesting question. So this patient is wondering if you are on a you know multiple year study, is it not obvious after the first year or so whether or not you were in the control group? Um, yeah, well, yeah. I, I think it really depends on the study and what they're they're studying. Um, uh, you know, and everyone, um, I think usually when they're in the study, they guess that they're either on the drug or the placebo. But when we go back and, and look after the fact, um, you know, a lot of times people are wrong. Um, so again, it really does depend on the drug and, you know, how effective it is and what um, it's aimed to do. Um, some drugs just aim at, at slowing down d disease progression. So it's a question of how much slower is my disease progression than someone else's. Um, so yeah, I think overall it's, it's really tough to tell sometimes. All right. Thank you. Um, sorry, just going through these questions. These are great questions. Thank you all for, for submitting them. Um, Okay, kind of back to the Canadian question and, you know, being in a different country, can particip can patients from Europe participate if they are U.S. citizens but reside overseas? Uh, you know, probably. Um, I can't say I've run into that situation personally. Um, I think it, again, depends on what the study involves. Um, if it's a, you know, a drug study, I'm not sure. Um, or if you have uh, required home health care visits, things like that, it may be more beneficial for you to try and find a site in your own country. Um, but again, maybe some of the the easier, the not easier necessarily, but but simpler studies with the imaging and things um, may be easier for you to participate in um, as a non-US resident. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then this is an interesting question. Um, I know, know you touched on insurance and billing a little bit, um, but this patient is having a hard time figuring out what insurance would cover um, visiting a center that participates in studies. So if, is there any resource or anything that can help figure that out? Um, this specific person is in California. Yeah, so I think it um, depends on the study. Um, a lot of studies will cover all of the costs of research. So your insurance doesn't even get, get billed at all and essentially they don't even know that you're participating in the study. Um, other times, um, you know, some, some things are covered, some aren't, uh, it can be a mix. So um, it really depends on the institution that you're seeking care at, care at and whether your insurance is accepted at that institution. Um, so I would say that would be the route to go um, if you're participating in a study that um, potentially is not fully paid for. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is, what is the name of the drug in the new AL trial? Um, so I'm not sure if they're referring to, I believe it's the Serenia trial. So that's the STI-6129 treatment. Um, so hopefully that was the question or that was the uh, trial you were referring to. Um, let's see. Um, this question is, what is the likelihood of finishing one clinical trial and starting another trial as technology and methodology progresses? Um, so more, and, and I'm not sure if this was referring to um, how the trial moves along into the different phases or if it's um, one patient being able to participate in 
um, multiple trials, but could you speak a little bit to that? Sure. Um, yeah. So um, oftentimes um, you can, as a participate per, patient, participate in um, you know another trial if the previous one has already concluded. Um, so that should certainly um, again depends a bit on the study, um, but it could definitely be a possibility. And then um, yeah, as far as um, the different phases of the study. Um, it really depends on whether the, the previous phase, um, you know, showed that the, the drug benefited or the, the treatment benefited patients. Um, certainly, as you move through phases of the study, more um, treatments drop off. Um, so there is a much smaller percentage that make it to that final kind of finish line, if you will, than started. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, and Kristen, um, there's a couple of questions here about um, being on a previous treatment and going through the washout period. I know that a couple of trials uh, specifically said you should stop taking um, your prior treatment for about two weeks. Um, but is there, you know, does the timeline vary or could you speak a little bit about um, prior treatment and stopping it before participating? Yeah, so I think it, it will vary by trial and vary by the like the drug that's being tested in the trial. Um, to go back to the prior question, there are definitely cases where patients can participate in one trial and then move on to another one after they complete that. Um, you just have to, again, keep in mind that some trials will require that you wash out for a certain amount of time from whatever treatment you may have received in the prior study. Or there might be instances where if you're looking to enroll in a trial with a similar technology, they might require that you have had no prior experience with similar type drugs. So um, it's possible, but it definitely depends on the trial and the, um, the eligibility criteria set for that particular trial. Um, and like you said, Lori, there may be instances where if you're receiving drugs that are commercially available and approved, you might need to wash off them for some time before you can enroll um, in a new trial. So it, it really does depend on the, the trial itself. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here if there's any upcoming trials with venetoclax um, and to that I would just recommend that you um, register for the myamyloidosis pathfinder and if anything comes up that matches your um, you know age prior treatment organ involvement um, then you'll be alerted as new trials come up um, but Kristen I'm not sure if you if there's anything planned at the moment or if you are able to speak to that? Yeah, Abby has not announced any plans to do um, a sponsored study. Um, there may be some investigator sponsored studies that could be looked at too, um, but I think your suggestion is best, Lori, to sign up for my amyloidosis pathfinder and as new trials are, are coming up, we'll, patients will be alerted um, that they're opening and that they may or may not be eligible for them. Great, thank you. Um, so we're just about out of time, and there are a lot of questions about specific treatments, um, and you know, we I think it's best to direct those to the companies. Uh, so we'll be sure to collect these questions and um, pass them along to the companies and make sure that you get the answers that you're looking for. Um, and there are a few questions also about whether or not the slides and recording are available um, in to that, yes, both will be available um, in about a week or two. Um, so if you're subscribed to our newsletter, um, take a look on the February newsletter for a link to a recording to this. Um, and then feel free to email us with any additional questions or give us a call. Um, you know, we definitely want to connect with you and make sure all your questions are answered. Um, so thank you everyone for taking the time to um, hear about clinical trials and amyloidosis today. Um, Lauren and Kristen, thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, I think that's all for today. Thank you everyone.